conversation. A meeting is being recorded. We just got the message. But welcome to CGU in Conversation with Camille Bousset. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone. I am Len Jessup. I am the president at Claremont Graduate University here in Claremont, California. I say here, technically I'm over across the street from campus in the president's house in my home office. I've got a nice little background so, I, so you don't all see the clutter in my office here. <laughs> Uh, but just across the street is CGU, it's part of the consortium of the seven Claremont Colleges. And it's great to be here with you today. And why don't we get started? So my first task is that I am to introduce my, uh, my co-host, uh, Robert Lang of Brookings Mountain West. So Rob, I'll read a little bit from your bio and then I'll go mm -hmm. off script for a moment about you if that's okay. But sure. Rob is a professor of public policy in the Greenspun College of Urban Affairs and serves as the executive director of both the Lindsay Institute and of Brookings Mountain West at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, UNLV, go Rebels. He's also a resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC uh, and holds a PhD in sociology from Rutgers University. Uh, prior to his time at UNLV, Rob was in similar, similar leadership roles at Virginia Tech in the College of Architecture and Urban Studies there. And before that, he was in leadership roles at Fannie Mae back in Washington, DC. Uh, and then and way before that was a research associate at Rutgers University uh, as well. Rob is, uh, you know, you, you've heard the old saying about somebody, he wrote the book on this or that. And Rob and his colleagues have written several uh, around urban growth and economic development and population dynamics, including the most recent Blue Metro's uh, Red States, a plug for the new book. It's terrific. It explains a lot of the election dynamics we saw recently in 2016. Uh, I highly recommend it. But <clears throat> off script, Rob, I'd have to say that in my time at UNLV, you and I worked really hard together on some big projects, you and your colleagues, both at Lindsay and at Brookings. And if it weren't for the teams at Lindsay and Brookings Mountain West, I don't know that UNLV would have a medical school or there would be a stadium and UNLV would have a role in the stadium. You guys wrote large sections, if not all, of the of the uh, governor's economic development plan, which led to great things for the state of Nevada. And I could, the list goes on and on and on. The <clears throat> medical education building, which you guys figured out a business model for that's now coming to fruition. So anyway, Rob, tremendous to be here again with you. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to you to tell us a bit about Camille. Thanks for the kind words, Lynn. I appreciate it. Uh, you're a great president of the school. You're, you're missed to this day. Uh, it's great to see you at Claremont. I'm glad we have this partnership. So Camille is someone that at Brookings Mountain West, we've worked with on several occasions. She actually headed up a, a project on the middle class in Las Vegas uh, that uh, is still in process. We've had you know a couple of policy reports come out of it so far. Uh, Camille's in governance studies, but she's so interdisciplinary. She's so part of the sort of new emphasis at the Brookings Institution to be interdisciplinary, that she's also part of economic studies and metro policy where I am located. And she's director, I want to get this right, of race, prosperity, inclusion initiative at, uh, at Brookings. And before she came to Brookings, like so many people at Brookings, there's lots of diverse background experience, public, private sector, in and around Washington, D.C. As Len noted, I was at Fannie Mae and uh, Camille was, for example, at, at the World Bank. And, you know, the, the funny thing in Washington is, uh, you know, I'll just say this and I'll turn it over to Camille. You could tell the sort of prestige of the institution by how swanky the lunches were that they did as policy events. And I was always impressed that no matter how wealthy Fannie Mae was, the World Bank always had better like catering and hors d'oeuvres and sort of better digs than Fannie Mae. So I deferred to it. I was always impressed with the world. You know, you couldn't go and get an account there. I had a lot of people ask me that, by the way, you know, what do you need to get an account at the World Bank? You know, maybe, you know, inclusion in the UN, for example. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a serious outfit, all, all kidding aside about the, the quality of DC uh, catered events. Uh, and uh, Camille's background is perfect for somebody who has seen the intersection of these forces, which she'll speak to today. And it's a partnership for not just her, but some of her colleagues like Richard Reeves, who we work with very closely. And the good news is that we're mid process on a bunch of new deliverables that'll come out that are connected to even the shock of COVID right now. 
and you know Co uh, Camille's just indispensable in all this work and I'm happy that uh, I suggested to Len that she'd be a, a good person for the seminar that really met the charge of the series. So I'll turn it over with that to Camille. Camille, it's all yours. Thanks very much, Rob. Um, it's so wonderful to be uh, with both of you here, Len and Rob. And um, it has been just such an honor to be working with Brookings Mountain West, such a fantastic set of colleagues and students. I'm always very, very energized by um, when I go there and when I work with you guys. So it's just been a fantastic partnership. But with respect to World Bank lunches, um, my son, who's now 15, but when I left the World Bank was 12, um, said to me, mom, are you, but are we gonna be able to go back to the cafeteria over there? And I was like, well, no, because I don't work there anymore. And that seemed to be like a real tragedy from his perspective, because he, when he would go, he would get sushi and then, you know, stuff from the Middle East and you pile his plate high with all these amazing things and it would cost me like $80 to feed him at the World Bank. But um, so yeah, real tragedy for him, but we've moved on and he tells me that Brookings has good lemon bars. So I think we're good. Oh, nice. Right. <laughs> that's, uh, that's kind of here at CGU, kind of how we feel about Pomona College. <laughs> we look across campus, uh, <clears throat> the relative riches. But Camila, you know, when we do the CGU in conversation, we usually start off with a few questions just so the audience can get to know you, the person, a bit better. And so if you wouldn't mind, take us back to your beginning as you think of you when you were at that young age, like you just described, what, um, who were your early influences back then? Maybe a parent or another family member or a teacher or a coach, you know, whomever it might have been, but who were the people who had an early influence on you that led you to this place that you are now? You know, that's such a great question and something I, I think about frequently now that I'm a parent and, you know, have to sort of conjure that stuff up for, uh, for my son as well. Um, but, you know, I, my, my family is originally, they're originally immigrants. So my dad's family from Trinidad and my mom's uh, family from the Dominican Republic. And um, we were always, you know, as a family, we had a very big extended family, which is very true for immigrants. You know, all the people are always in the household. And um, we... Uh, it, as, a, as a family, we had a very big interest in um, politics, and it was always a subject at the dinner table, and, you know, everybody would get into it, and, you know, what very common in these kind of family settings, you'd have three different conversations going on, and sometimes they would cross, and that sort of thing, so very sort of intense um, and uh, vibrant kind of family life, and um, I ended up being sort of having that be the, the foundation for my interest in politics and policy. I went on to do other things as an undergrad. I was originally pre-med and really liked that. And then um, sort of did an about face after I got into, after I was accepted to medical school, um, I had been taking all this poli sci, you know, and, and public policy, um, these courses, economics courses. And I just, at the end decided, you know, that's really not me. I'm not really somebody who wants to work, you know, 90 hours, plus and in you know, the 72 hour schedule. And I really am interested in policy and the way it impacts people's lives. And so um, I would say that is, so I kind of reverted to where I had started um, in my family. And I would say, you know, my parents were really the most influential there. Um, but then once I got to graduate school, I would say my graduate advisor was probably the most influential. Adam Kaczorski, I worked with, he's now Professor Emeritus at NYU. Um, but he really focused me in a, a really interesting way. And I think that stayed with me. Um, I am very, very problem oriented. Like I look at things as, okay, there's a problem and how can I train, you know, a variety of different perspectives to try to solve that problem. And that's kind of how I've approached almost everything I've done professionally since graduate school. That's great. When you're with family now, uh, maybe not these holidays because we're all going to be uh, staying right. at home and being safe. But you know, normal times at a <clears throat> holiday gathering, you're back with family. Do they still want to have those wonky policy discussions with you, or is it about they're they're you know more interested in other things to talk about? No, no, we still we still have those, and you know, my family is obviously larger now because my brothers have gotten married and um, all that. No, everybody's still very very interested in politics and very um, you know really. Uh, intensely engaged and it's interesting because I come you know they all live they live in your wonderful state I'm, I'm a Californian 
And so they all live in Northern California, no offense, but they all live there. I, I was born in Southern California, so I do have roots down there. Um, but, uh, you know, somebody coming from Washington, D.C., it's like, oh, you're the source of all the information, like what's really going on over there. So, um, yeah, I get, to, I get to chat about about politics as well. <laughs> a quick commercial Chamber of Commerce for Southern California. It's 79 degrees and sunny here right now. So well, that's a, good because, you know, it's like 38 degrees here in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, oh, boy. <laughs> as my family says, why are you still out there? <laughs> <laughs> what? So fast forward now. And so what, what brought you to Brookings? What was, how, how, did, how did that happen? And what was the lure into the Brookings Institute? So a quick, quick background there. I um, had, before coming to Brookings, I'd spent a lot of time working in the consumer finance sector um, on regulation and then on policy. And I did that both domestically um, and internationally uh, in, on the corporate side, uh, nonprofit side, and then obviously for the World Bank. So that was kind of my background. Um, but whenever you work in consumer finance, you always hit up against these issues of um, opportunity and um, who is neglected, essentially, who has wealth, who doesn't, who can manage their finances, who has problems with that, who has finances. Um, and I decided while I was at the World Bank that whatever my next move was going to be, I was going to work on the do domestic intersection of race, class, and um, economic uh, mobility. So I just decided that that's what I was going to do. And this job came up at Brookings and I applied for it and I didn't actually think I was going to get it um, because, you know, I figured they had people who were just much more steeped in the domestic context. But um, I was, you know, fortunate to get the job. And um, since I've been there, it's been a fantastic ride. I have had a lot of latitude and a lot of opportunity to sort of set the course um, for the work that me and, you know, that I do and that my team does. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we've gotten tremendous support, so much so that John Allen actually launched, he's our, the president um, at Brookings, yeah. launched yeah. Uh, a pres presidential research priority on race, um, equity, and justice this year. Okay, yeah. terrific. Had you come in under Strobe or was under later under John? No, I came in under Strobe. Yeah, yeah I came in in 20, uh, mid-2017. Yeah. And uh, so Strobe was still president and was for um, for at least another six or seven months after that. Okay. Yeah, I think during, Rob, right during my time at UNLV, I think I was pretty much all under the, the leader, Brookings was under the leadership of Strobe Talbot, of course. So that's the person that we would meet with when he would come to town. Yes, he was yeah. the president the whole time. Yeah. In fact, he's been the president the whole time even I've been at UNLV, which dates back to 2010. Okay. Yeah. He had a very, had very, very long tenure um, yeah. as president of Brookings. Yeah, it was great to work with him and I'm excited with, with your, your new leader. Of course, don't know him personally, but of course know a lot about him. Uh, it's uh, got to be an exciting time there. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so now <clears throat> we'll get into the meat of some of the, the questions that, that uh, we've come up with. The first one, and Rob, feel, feel, feel free to jump in at any time, but I'll start with this initial one. 2020, quite a year, uh, and unpre unprecedented in, in many ways, and stress-inducing as well, uh, in so many ways. Uh, from every vantage point, it is clear that we are a nation divided, uh, and we saw that play out in many ways around the election, and even in uh, and not not around the election. So, Camille, what do you what are your thoughts on maybe what what got us here? So, what are the underlying dynamics that sort of lead us to be in this? state and maybe even more important your thoughts on how we might begin to bridge that divide is is there a way forward a way out of this division sure you know um i will i will start with the sort of my more more positive thoughts and that's to say that you know in the end of the day we're all uh it, it, we're all people who want the same thing i think um and i think that's important to remember right we get up we want to um to, to have a, a day that's rewarding. We want to be um, valued. We want to be loved and we want the people we love to do well. Um, and we wanna have the resources that allow us to do well and allow our families to do well. And I think that at the end of the day is what everybody wants. And I think we have to remember that we all have that in common. Um, and uh, somewhere along the way prior to this election, um, the things that that you know appear to divide us 
um, I think were things that were, um, that got a lot more attention and both by the media um, and certainly the, the White House um, and a range of other actors. And so I think there just has been, um, there's just been a sort of a, a festivus of feeding on divisions, divisions that may not actually be that critical for Americans. And uh, when we think about where we are right now, right, everybody's facing the same pandemic. Um, regardless of who you are, um, you are, you know, under a lot of stress. You may have lost a family member, you know, sadly to the pandemic, or you may have gotten, you know, gotten sick with coronavirus. Um, you certainly have been impacted your work. Uh, you may have either lost a job or you've made drastic changes in the way that you work. Um, your kids, you know, if you have kids are also having um, to adjust. So everybody's having to adjust and everybody's having, you know, a very similar stressful kind of experience. Some are having it more, is more stressful for others, for some than others. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think we're all, we're all in this boat together. And I think one of the things about coronavirus is that it has shown how similar um, we are in the end as human beings, that in the end, we want to socialize, um, that we want to be with people we love, and that we want to be able to get on with our lives. And so um, I think we can build from that. And I think, uh, you know, not just politically, but I mean, as communities, I think we can heal um, and really build on those commonalities. Politically speaking, um, you know, the new administration will build on that. Um, and I know this is something we'll be talking about, but I think it's incumbent on all of us to think about what's common in our experiences and move forward with that. Yeah. Uh, Len, could I, could I follow yeah, up on that and ask yeah. real, something related even to this uh, election and directly derived from what Len is talking about so you know from this election that there was a big divide between million plus metropolitan areas, big blue right. metros as I track versus smaller metros, small towns, rural areas. Uh, could you speak to the race and opportunity mix with regard to place and whether or not, you know, there is a kind of an economic or cultural divide that is the barrier that is now separating the more, let's say, robust discussion on, on race and opportunity that you should have at the national level, but is hampered by some of the divisions you've identified? Yeah, um, absolutely. And I think that's a, that's a great question. So, you know, very recently um, I had, uh, was just serving on a panel for the greater Akron area and they were talking about inclusive growth. And the greater Akron area is a great, um, I think, uh, sort of case study for what you're talking about. Because you have, you know, as, um, as far as the demographics there, you have a very, very large um, African-American population. And you also have a large population of working class whites who have um, not been able to uh, recover from the sort of post-industrial, you know, disinvestment um, in the Akron area. And so what's interesting about that is we often talk about those two populations as though they are completely different, right? So people who are, who, who you know, were, who had good um, working class jobs and now no longer have that, and they're white. And then people in, you know, Blacks uh, in, in uh, Akron who never really had access to those kinds of jobs. And we think about them as very different. The histories are indeed different. But where people need to go, how they need to move forward is actually quite similar. And so I think, you know, when we're thinking about these metro areas that you're talking about, um, and we're thinking about revitalization, there has to be a narrative of not leaving anybody behind. And what I mean by that is, yes, there are going to be certain targeted programs for people who have not been able to be economically mobile ever, but there also need to be programs for people who find themselves in a, a kind of a stasis from a career perspective. And we need to have, a, we need to have an attitude that we are better off bringing everybody with us. And, um, but those divisions are real in the, the, in the, you know, as you've mentioned, and people tend to think of these groups as really different. And I actually think that we need to start, you know, thinking outside the box there and really thinking about what are the commonalities, particularly when you're talking about economic development, you know, you want everybody to have a paycheck. You want people to be participant 
in the economy. And the only way you can do that is to make sure everyone is participating. Excellent. You know, as, as you asked that question, Rob, and Camille, as you were answering, you remind me of a colleague who's probably watching us right now on the team here at CGU. And she said that as an experiment, because she felt she needed to, she needed to, to better understand, politically speaking, under the other side, you know, kind of the other team. And that for two or three weeks, she's running an experiment of just watching news on the other side in the evening. Uh, right. And it's not necessarily aimed at changing her mind, but that helping her to understand people who, who sort of that, that is the feed, you know, that they're getting and to sort of understand their understanding and where they're coming from. I thought it was an interesting, uh, interesting experience. It is, very, it is very interesting. And I think, you know, Rob has done a really great job in his book talking about these various different uh, political profiles and demographic profiles. And um, what, I, what I do think is, is interesting is that um, Biden was able to put together an, a, a coalition that was really a bit unlike the Trump coalition, right? He actually, he brought in working class whites along with um, Latinos, particularly on, in the Southwest, West and Southwest, um, and African Americans. And I think that's an interesting starting point. And Rob, I'd love to get your thoughts on that um, since you know, your book came out before the 2020 election, but I think speaks to some of the, uh, some of the results we saw in the 2020 election. Sure, and you know, we just ran the data because you know, things are getting certified. So it's the first time I can actually answer a question about, you know, what was the divide? What was the coalition? And you're right, what happened is, it's interesting that there's been so much focus on Philadelphia as a city or Wayne County. And what you see is actually Biden's wins were at the larger Metro level in the suburbs. For example, in, in the critical state of Pennsylvania, which is, you know, the sort of real tipping point state in the country at this point. Uh, and, the Philly metro area overperformed for Biden because of its suburbs that included white working class districts in Delaware County, just outside of Philly. And that Biden actually suffered some loss from Clinton's numbers in Philadelphia proper. You see that all around the country. And Latinos are interesting because you made the distinction in the, in the West and Southwest, Latinos held and there was loss by that coalition in South Florida in particular, along the Rio Grande Valley. And Biden has the elements of a larger working coalition than if Clinton had won in 16. She won the popular vote, lost the electoral college because it actually did reach into, and it actually underperformed in some minority uh, demographics and then overperformed with whites without college degrees, which is typically seen as working class and close some of the gender gap as well, that men don't vote as differently as women in some of these categories that they did. Men with college degrees uh, really closed the gap in the suburbs of larger metros, million plus that we're tracking. And, you know, so the temperature is down a little on where we were. It's not as stark a divide as it was in 16. There's still a giant gap in that Biden won a very small geography, which is highly concentrated in these metros, and he lost any metro below 500,000 practically. Yeah. In fact, that's the, that's the tipping point. And, and he loses suburbs, incidentally, if the suburbs have 800 people or more per square mile, we find that they tend to go for the Democrats. If they're less than 800 people per square mile, they tend to go two thirds to the Republicans. So it's a lot about urban populations, a lot about people whose exposure to difference in large scale metros of, you know, diversity and people working from around the world. And, you know, even if you're a white and you're in Atlanta, it's, you know, and you, and you go to Georgia Tech and you work in technology and you see the global economy as expressed and successful in Atlanta, you have very different attitude from somebody who's in South Georgia. Yeah, I think that's true. That's right. Quickly, so a comment that came in on the chat, it's interesting, these comments suggest that leadership and how these issues are framed is critical. So what's the comment around leadership? That's a nice segue into actually one of our, our questions that we intended was, we've got a new presidential administration coming in in the, in the new year, just a matter of weeks away. So how best, Camille, can the new presidential administration engage the nation? In particular, the question is around 
issues of race and inclusion and equality. What do you what do you think needs to be done there, and what role does leadership play in that? Sure, um, I think leadership is actually is actually really important, um, particularly at the federal level. And you know, we have seen um, in the current administration, the Trump administration, how important leadership has been to um, not only the tone that people are taking, but the actual policies that have been pursued. And that will be true for Biden as well. I mean, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's going to be setting the tone and also setting the policy landscape. Um, and so very just, you know, nuts and bolts, straightforward. It's really, really important. But beyond that, and I think what this question gets to in the, the other part of your question is, you know, what is the tone actually that Biden should be setting um, when it comes to these divisions? And you know, my my uh, you know my perspective is that Biden has a lot to gain from building on the coalition that Rob just um, you know outlined. There, um, he has a he has a pretty a pretty broad coalition, and he should build upon that and be trying to create a narrative of a country working together to get itself back in, you know, uh, in the, basically in, in, you know, in top shape, um, both from an economic and a cultural perspective. I mean, we really have been battered by the coronavirus um, and the coronavirus has exposed a whole web of neglect um, in this country, um, but it's not something that we cannot solve. And because he has a, a pretty broad coalition, he should be able to speak to a range of Americans about the importance of pulling together and making sure we do not leave anybody left behind. We do not leave anybody behind as we re-emerge a really, really strong economy and a really strong society that is well knit together. And I think that that really has to be his message, not only from a narrative perspective, but from a policy perspective as well. Yeah. yeah. Interesting, but our uh, our endowments managed by Goldman Sachs and the advice they were giving us before the election, just trying to predict what would happen in 2021, was that they said that if they felt bullish, uh, that if there was a if, if there was a Biden win, you know, in the White House, but yet the Republicans held the Senate, there'd be that stalemate that in in years you know uh, in presidential cycles past has actually helped the country economically. And they thought that if that happened, that that combined with coming out of the pandemic would actually bode well uh, for what 2021 would look like. Um, it's inter interesting and kind of playing out now. Of course, we'll have to wait and see what happens with the two races in Georgia. Of course, a lot of focus and money being spent there. Uh, yeah, just, just a quick comment on that. I'm not sure yeah. I agree with Goldman Sachs on, on one just one point there, yeah. which is that, um, you know, having the balance, sometimes we think about having um, different parties holding different parts of, of the um, government is a good thing. And I actually think in some cases, it's not always positive. And this would be one of those cases. So the reason I say that is that we are in a very, very deep recession. Um, and when you have a deep recession, what typically happens is people start to think about the economy as a zero sum kind of pot, right? So if you give something to somebody, then you're taking away from somebody else. When in reality, the, Amer the, the U.S. can spend its way out of this recession. Um, and I say that, you know, uh, because we, um, we have the number one currency in the world. People still borrow in our currency. Um, and there are just many, many reasons from a, you know, fiscal and monetary perspective that make it possible for us to spend our way out of this. But what happens is um, if you have a Senate that remains in Republican hands, there will be a narrative about how we can't spend this money when in reality we can actually do it. And I think this recession is so deep, um, it's so deep that you know, large sectors of the economy may disappear if we don't spend enough. Um, it's, it's so deep that I think we actually need to be um, really investing a lot of money. And I think in this case, having Republicans say, no, we need to be fiscally conservative right now I think will put brakes on a potential recovery. So I, in that respect, I actually disagree a little bit. With okay, yeah, fair enough. Shifting gears back to economics for a moment. This is a question sort of that about kind of macro micro. And it's that we often talk about the economy and we're doing a bit of it here at the, at the macro level. 
And, but, but yet it's about personal and individual, real people, you know, and real issues day to day uh, that, that make up the collective that we theorize when we talk about macroeconomics. So what does economic sustainability mean for individual Americans and what opportunities might we have to create progress and growth, especially for disadvantaged individuals? Yeah, that is a great question. And, you know, I think um, one hates to say that there's a silver lining from coronavirus, but I think it has given us an opportunity to rethink how, uh, you know, how we have um, led our lives from an economic perspective and from a policy perspective. And, and the way we have led our lives over the last you know, a couple of hundred years is that we have um, distinct haves and, and have nots. And that is, a, uh, that is an artifact um, of intentional policy. And so uh, right now, when we're thinking about how we're gonna spend money to get ourselves out of a coronavirus pandemic uh, recession, then we also should be thinking about what are the things that we need to change to make sure that, you know, black and brown people, indigenous people in, this, in the United States are also um, gaining from a recovery. And so it does, the, the coronavirus recession gives us an opportunity to rethink that and we should not waste that opportunity. Um, so, you know, for, for, the, for the individual American, the most important thing is that we have a vibrant economy. We cannot have a vibrant economy when something like one third of, of the folks are, uh, you know, don't have, enough, don't have enough to eat, don't have a job or have jo dropped out of the job market. Um, so we need to find a way to make sure that every American who wants a job can get one. So we have to increase the economic pie um, and we have to make sure that people are not, um, you know, tens of thousands and millions of people are not waiting on food lines. And so I think the number one thing that the Biden administration has to do and every other policymaker down the line is really make sure that we stabilize Americans um, and nobody is falling through the cracks. And then we build on that and uh, get back to economic vibrancy, but an economic vibrancy that, that creates good jobs with benefits for everybody who wants a job. You touched on the pandemic. Are there other ways that the pandemic has shifted your work and research or your thinking uh, at Brookings, particularly with the, the work on the middle class? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there, we have the Future of the Middle Class Initiative that Rob alluded to, um, uh, and um, we're, there we have focused a lot on how do we, the, we focus a lot on the fact that the middle class is very stressed in America. And of course that has become, you know, abundantly clear during the um, pan pandemic. Um, but what we really focus on there is what are the policies in general that m would make the middle class much more vibrant, less stressed, et cetera. Um, and that, that work has actually redoubled in a bit during the pandemic because what we've seen, for instance, is um, not having paid family leave, which you know was really a topic of debate, has been a topic of debate you know, for many, many years at the yeah. federal level. What we've seen is that actually that creates a public health crisis. Um, and when you create a public health crisis because you don't have paid family leave, that creates an economic crisis. So now, you know, we have gotten to the point where some of the policies that were considered uh, very radical um, have now become very mainstream given what's happened in the pandemic. So for that particular initiative, um, a lot of the work that we've been doing has now become, um, has really become center stage as the federal government tries to pick through a variety of different policies that they might, um, you know, propose in an incoming Biden administration. Yeah, interesting. I, as you're saying that, I was thinking that even our organization here at CGU pre-pandemic, we were pretty conservative around telework, <laughs> and now, right. you know, we're proving to ourselves that we can all work from home and we can get the job done. And so it's going to—I'm sure it's going to shift uh, how how we feel about and how we practice telework post-pandemic, and I suspect that will happen. I'm hearing that from my corporate friends. Uh, they're thinking the same things for their organizations as well. Yeah, I think that's actually very healthy. And I think, um, you know, one of the things, and, and Rod, it would be great to get your, your perspective and Lynn on this too, is now that you basically, in a lot of places, there, there are obviously a lot of jobs where you just can't work from anywhere, right? I mean, if you're working in a grocery store or a hospital, um, you know, or a gas station, you know, you actually need to be there physically, right? But there are a lot of jobs where 
you don't really need to be in that place where your employer is. And I, I always wonder about what the advantages might be politically to people being, okay, you know, I'm going to move to Tennessee. I mean, I live in Washington, D.C., but I'm going to move to Tennessee because I like it down there and it's beautiful and I can still get my work done. And I, I wonder how that might play out politically and whether there are some advantages to that. Now, funny you should raise that because I'm working on the state's economic development uh, plan or recovery plan now uh, at the moment. And that's come up because, you know, a state like Nevada is so close to California and in relative terms of taxation, it's so low tax. Right. And so the question is, can we have, you know, instead of boom towns, zoom, zoom towns, as they're now being called, uh, because there is a large section of work uh, that, you know, as you noted, there are, there are occupations, you have to be there, you know, if you're checking people on a plane or something like that. But there's an enormous amount of white collar work that was office based. And what's happened is about a 10 year acceleration in trends that were already occurring. In other words, there was already a movement in areas like IT and sales to sort of let you loose from the office. You would come back and do what's called hoteling at the office right. where you'd visit the office. And what it means is that there's some share of Americans are gonna be more footloose where they can live in one metropolitan economy and work in another that's proximate to it. Now here's the caveat. There's still, you still have to move through an organization and you still need face-to-face -face exchanges, but they're less frequent. So you can't move to Kathmandu. But if you're at a place right. like Las Vegas, for example, where there's excellent you know, plane service, where there's airlines galore, and you need to get back to the Bay Area or to Los Angeles or to Phoenix, it's easy. And if you need to show up a couple of times a month, that's just built into your, into your travel budget, basically. And so we're looking at the longer term effect on that. And Nevada is one of the beneficiaries. And you've already seen, by the way, what's interesting politically is so much of even Northern Nevada, which is proximate to the Bay Area, has benefited by the Bay Area's expatriation of certain businesses, you know, notably Tesla, but others. It's actually made Washoe County, which is Reno, so much more liberal that Trump actually gained in Clark County. And whatever he gained, he lost so much back in Washoe, the state was even Stephen with the last election. The state wow, would have been so more competitive he was actually gaining in Clark, but that so many Californians, people, Northern Nevada, and Californians traditionally, you know, occupied Southern Nevada. We estimate three times the number of people born in California that vote in Nevada's elections in Clark County than native born to the state. But you didn't have as much of that in the North and you have it now. So it's actually transforming, you know, what, what is a swing state and, and making it bluer. And it's changing opportunity structure in that you might be able to get a first rate job and live in a low cost region. And you might be able to then not have to sort of live in a hovel in these boom tech towns. And it might benefit a large chunk of the middle class that's not on the fastest track to the senior most positions at Google, but of the kind of yeoman like employment. Suddenly you can live in Reno, you can live in Vegas and you can work those jobs. So we, we think of it as something positive in our terms, in terms of the perspective of Nevada, for economic development. You, Rob, you touched on Southern California. That was one of the questions I wanted to ask. It's a good time to ask it. CGU is located in Claremont, obviously. We're within LA County. We're right on the edge of LA County, literally the edge of the Claremont Colleges. You cross the street, you know, now you're in, you've got Riverside County and San Bernardino County and the Inland Empire. So while we're technically part of the LA Metroplex, we're also in the 909 and we, we embrace that. We're a part of the burgeoning Inland Empire. So, but my question is about this whole area, which you know, now back here, I had lived here earlier in my career, now being back again, it's obviously an incredibly diverse and, and incredibly powerful, you know, economically speaking and culturally speaking region within the country. And do you think the either one of you, the dynamics around race and economic parity look different here in an area like this, maybe as compared to how they might look in other parts of the country? Well, um, you know, I think, yes, it does look different now um, than, than other parts of the country as you move further east. Um, but I think, you know, what we saw in Maricopa County during this election, so meaning, you know, you had a lot of an influx of um, people from other metro areas, 
um, very diverse folks moving in there and those folks, you know, uh, voted um, in 2020. I think that's actually the future of the country. It might take, you know, another 30 years for it to reach, you know, um, all the way on the East Coast. But I, I definitely think that what we saw, uh, you know, in Maricopa County, what we see currently in LA County, um, what we see in Clark County, I think th that's the future of the United States. Um, you know, I have a, a colleague, uh, we have a colleague at Brookings here, Bill Fry, who is a demogra dem demographer. And he, um, I think it was a couple of years ago, said that the demographics now are this more than 50% of kids under 10 um, are kids of color. And so that was like a couple of years ago. So, you know, th that, that um, trend has just intensified. So I think we're going to see that. And, you know, what I, what I, what I find really fascinating about that change um, is the way in which it will get channeled into politics. And I think we've seen one model of that um, in California, which is, you know, when you look at the state houses, it is, you know, something like 95% democratic. Um, that may look a little different as we move further east um, and as the type of Latino voter um, and politician also changes. Um, and so I think it'll be very interesting to see, you know, it doesn't mean that politically everything is gonna be like, um, like California, but I do think demography, from a dem demographic perspective, it will be. Um, but I think the political outcomes of it might be a little bit different depending on where you're talking about what other kinds of groups are politically active. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. inland California, the Inland Empire on its own, has 5 million residents and is really a top 15 US metropolitan area and is quite diverse and has significantly changed. Its, its trajectory of change is, is sharper than it's been on the west side of LA because the west side of LA was already diverse. Right. And what, Inland Empire, what the Inland Empire has received is a lot of people who couldn't afford to live at the coast and didn't wanna to move to Las Vegas or onto Texas just took up residence deeper into California at lower cost. And so it's been kind of a release valve on the high costs of coastal California. And it's a harbinger of what is to come. It's that, you know, the, the kind of metropolitan change you've seen where you are, Len, and you're right at that gateway. Yeah. Uh, that's a kind of gateway into the country writ large. And in 10 or 20 years or four or five presidential cycles, it's gonna be ubiquitous and the politics will have to reflect that. There won't be any hiding from this by 2030. It'll be what it is. Yeah. It's the last kind of gasp of sort of denying it at the moment. You know, and I, mean, I don't mean that means the Republicans necessarily lose. The politics could shift so dramatically that they become a party identified with opportunity, capture a lot of that immigrant energy, don't speak poorly of immigrants, change their narrative on that. And the next thing you know, they have the governing coalition because they're so successful. Yeah, right. And they have elements of that too. I mean, southern, parts of Southern Texas, um, obviously elements in the Miami area, you know, there, there's certainly elements from which they could construct that. Yeah, absolutely. Bob, you and I, ex extending that, your comments on, on Southern California to the conversations you and I have had about the region, the kind of Las Vegas, Southern California, and then the, the Metroplex around uh, Metropolitan Phoenix and the connections that how those Little, not little, those large city states are connected together culturally and economically. Do you mind sharing some of that? And then maybe Camille can respond to that as well. Sure. In brief, the, you know, the model that I did with Chris Nelson, who's at the University of Arizona, uh, and I worked at Michael Crow at ASU on the Sun Corridor project, uh, which is Phoenix and Tucson combined. The model is that the way you integrate into the global economy is you usually don't sweep in a single metro. But if you're in Seattle, you sweep in the whole Puget Sound. If you're in the, Texas, you take a lot of the Texas Triangle, which is you know, Houston, San Antonio, uh, Austin, you know, places like that, Dallas. In the Southwest, the, the inland, inland empires are actually Phoenix and Las Vegas. And they're wholly dependent really on the success of Southern California's integration into the global economy. Because what they are, are they are essentially tiered one level below in terms of global trade, but they're not backwaters in that they're not in the middle of Iowa. They're not, you know, they're not Des Moines. They're well positioned as long as the entire unit itself sees its future 
as a globally integrated area that's competing against other large scale areas in Asia and Europe, like you know, parts of Southwest Germany in auto manufacturing, or you know, the area from you know, Seoul down to Busan in Korea. That that space that we're in, we're essentially in the same metropolis because that especially changes with the Zoom economy. Yeah, I agree with that, and I think um, you know I love I love that model, and I think if if um, if that can be factored into you know all kinds of economic development policies and workforce policies, um, even policies around higher education, I think that makes for such a juggernaut. And as you're as, as you're saying, you know, yeah, you have to depend on LA still has to be LA, but LA will continue to be LA, and um, that kind of integrated policy, I think, is really. It, that is going to be the distinction between places that do well and places that don't do well. Inland places that do well and inland places that don't do well. Mm -hmm. Exciting to think about collective action around Southern California, Phoenix Metro, uh, and Las Vegas. We've seen some of that, Rob, obviously with the I-11 corridor and the work on the, on the bullet train on this side. So a little bit of that collective action, but boy, wouldn't it be nice to, to envision that and seeing that actually come to fruition. Yeah. Well, Normally this, we do about 45 minutes of what's, what are supposed to be kind of my questions and then the last 15 minutes to turn to audience questions. And I've been kind of doing a hybrid of that throughout. Um, but I'll, I'll pull next a question that came in from an audience member. And this is, I'll, and I'll read this just so I capture it right. Do you feel that a multi-party system, political system would better represent the collective interests I'm just going to read of, of black people or native people and how do the needs and strategies for improved representation differ between groups due to the significant difference in population. I thoughts on that Camille I'll toss that to you. Um, sure. Um, you know, it's such so interesting. We've tried many times to have a third party that's equally muscular to the Republicans yeah. and the Democrats. And before that, the, you know, the Whigs and, um, uh, and it just hasn't taken root. And I think part of it is because there's the way money works in our political system and it's just really hard from a financial perspective to start a new party. So it's, uh, you know, other places uh, around the world obviously, you know, have multi-party democracies and those work well. So it's not a matter of whether or not the model actually works well or is validated. It is validated in other places, um, but it just doesn't seem to work well here. Uh, so what that means is that um, most of our political representation is going to be funneled through these two parties. And these two parties need to be responsive to the changes that are happening. But what's really interesting about the United States is that the party representation tends to be a little bit more conservative than the actual electorate. And there are several reasons for that. Um, one having to do with the electoral college as we've seen. Um, then the next having to do with the way the Senate has been set up. Um, the third having to do with the role of money in politics and people who um, are either lobbyists or fund campaigns um, tend to be more conservative than people who don't have that money. And so they also have um, you know, uh, a large impact on who ends up representing us. So, uh, so there are many, there are many, um, you know, many forces in, in the structure of US politics that tend to make the representatives a little less uh, progressive than the actual elect electorate, I mean, writ, you know, writ large. Uh, and so the one way to counter that is to make sure that people who, um, you know, are really interested in having progressive voices represent them are registered to vote, actually vote, um, and are really, uh, are very active in the lower levels of policy uh, lower levels of politics, and those lower levels, you know, tend to feed up to the federal level. So um, there are many ways, there, there are a couple ways to counteract that, but I think overall it has to do with voting um, and making sure you're participating in the voting process and participating in the political process at lower levels. And one more element I'd add is that it's a winner-take-all structure. Yes, so correct. So think about 1992. There's right. Ross Perot, he wins 20% of the vote. Right. So you effectively have a third party for that brief moment, but Perot wins nothing. He has right. not a single electorate. Right. Mm -hmm. In a parliamentary structure, he would have been the kingmaker. He could have been in a coalition with George H.W. Bush that right. would have 
together comprised the majority and he would have been secretary of state or treasury secretary in Bush's, in Bush's cabinet. That's, correct. That's not the way it works in the United States. You go home and you've got nothing. And so the That's structure correct. itself creates coalescence around two political poles that then are in a dialectic. They're in a structure against one another. And in, unless we change that fundamentally, along with the Electoral College, the fact that the Senate overrepresents smaller states and all these other things just play right into that. If we had a different structure, we'd have more parties than cable channels. We'd have like the beer drinkers party. Because think <laughs> about how you know, fickle Americans are. You know? But yeah. you know, we have two parties. I mean, how could this country only have two? Look at how much shopping choice we have. Right, no, it's very true. Very, very true, well said. That sounds like an actual party. I think you're, you'd, go, you'd be behind that. <laughs> you know, Brett Kavanaugh would have been the appointee to the Supreme Court out of the beer drinkers party. It turns out he likes beer. True. What you know? Speaking of that, you maybe think about the electoral college. Are we looking at an assault on the electoral college? Do you think that that model still has legs, or is that is that antiquated model that needs to be rethought? Well, you know, I I do think we've proven that, um, you know, American citizens are capable of voting for whoever they want to represent them and don't really need the Electoral College in between all that. Um, and there are obviously complexities associated with that, but every, you know, four years, this is a topic and um, nothing ever changes. So I, you know, maybe Rob has a crystal ball, um, but I don't, I don't see us making any changes in that system. I mean, Biden won the election by over 7 million votes, popular votes. The guy came within 40,000 votes of having an electoral college tie, which meant he would have gone to the Congress and Trump would have won because of, because of the way the right. electoral college works. The only out is probably not constitutional, but the electoral college voter compact, the uh, popular voter compact rather, which says that uh, the, the votes in any state would be assigned to the national popular vote winner, but it, it's only got about 200 states Elector is represented right now. You need 270 for it to work. And Nevada actually passed it in 2019. And the governor vetoed it because he wants to stay a swing state. He wants the tourism off the swing state was the, was the rationale. So there's all these sort of weird things. Unless there's an unmitigated disaster of several elections that go awry in a row, in a row I just don't see it happening. Camille, as you look forward at, at your kind of body of work coming up in 2021, what are you most excited about? What are the projects you just can't wait to, to dive into and to put some to put some work into? What excites you, you about the year coming? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. I mean, one of the things I've done over the last couple of years is I, I did a project where um, we interviewed uh, people in four different cities um, about who they, who they turn to when they want to find a new job, new housing opportunity or new educational opportunity. Um, we did that in Charlotte, Racine, uh, San Francisco and Washington DC. And, and overall, what we found is that um, people tend to turn to people who look like them. So they have very homogenous um, social relationships when it comes to economic opportunity. And in this country, that tends to mean they're racially homogenous. Those groups are racially homogenous. Um, and when you compare the groups in terms of the resourcing in, in those social relationships and social networks, we found obviously that whites and particularly white men were the most uh, resourced. Black men were the least resourced in the sense that they had fewer people to turn to when they were trying to access jobs and opportunities. Um, and then we looked you know, obviously behind that and there are many, many reasons that you know, to explain that, but what came to the fore was that black boys in particular, and this is true for Native American boys as well, though we did not study them, but they tend to be pulled out of the kinds of situations where you would build those social relationships and at school, um, and then later, uh, you know, um, as they become men uh, in terms of employment, um, they're frequently incarcerated, et cetera. So they just tend to be pulled out and they don't have those social relationships. All that to say that, the project that I really wanna work on is um, how do we target black male unemployment, make that a key statistic for, uh, for national policy and try to drive that statistic down um, to equal 
white male unemployment. And the reason I wanna work on that is that there's so much that's underneath that bad statistic. So mm -hmm. many, you know, a legacy of so many bad policies, et cetera, that it's gonna force us to examine a range of other policy, um, uh, policy choices. And what happens when you drive down the black male unemployment rate is you also create opportunities for other people who are also marginalized. So it's like a, like a curb cut, you know, where you make the curb cut and people with wheelchairs use it, but so do skateboarders and, and um, you know, people who have uh, um, uh, strollers, et cetera. So I see, I see that as being an area that I really wanna focus on. And um, I'm really using it as a leverage point to uplift a, a number of marginalized communities. Excellent. It's, you know, you reminded me that when I was back at UNLV, Rob, the under, among the undergraduate population, there was definitely, there were definitely differences in student success, especially the retention measure uh, between students of color versus not. I hadn't thought about that in terms of the, of the social relationships and the effect that that has. That's interesting. Hmm. Somebody's asked me, said, yeah, the, the role in graduate schools as well. So the, the difference we see at a place like CGU is less pronounced, but it's still there. It's, it's still, it's, there's still a difference. Yeah, no, I, I believe that. And, and it's, it's really interesting. We did not, we expected to find differences, obviously, when we did this work on social networks relative yeah. to economic mobility, but we didn't expect the differences to be that stark. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and, and really that segregated, actually. Um, so that speaks a lot to why even when we have really robust policies that are focused on, you know, um, creating a better job training or pipelines, et cetera, or getting more people into graduate school, that why we still don't get the results we're looking for. Yeah. Because yeah. socially, as social animals, we don't extend our social networks yeah. um, when it really counts. Camille, are you aware of the work by Xavier Briggs on social capital, leverage social capital? Yes. You did this, yeah. So you know that there's a literature that even says that the you know, the, the white advantage is the form of social capital that it takes that's not casual, but that the network exists to do things like provide right. job opportunity, for example. Right. That's part of the right. reason for the, the virtual Rolodex now. Right, so, exactly. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. exactly. Fascinating. Right. Fascinating work, Camille, and, and very important, uh, not only economically, but here, here within our environment as well. That's, I'm gonna have to look into this further, thank you. Yeah, no, happy to chat further about that one. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we've come to the appointed hour. So Camille, thank you so fast. much for spending time with us. Stay yeah. stay warm uh, back there and dry. Thank and stay you. And, and Rob, thank you too uh, for helping sure. uh, us, to, for finding Camille for us and helping us to set this up as well. Um, and uh, Rob, I'd like to follow up with you and find out what you're doing in 2021. We've, we've, we've yeah. run out of time, but it sounds like you've got an economic plan to work on. Yeah, and I'm writing, I'm starting a book uh, with Karen Danielson and David Damore on urbanized suburbs, about the characteristic of urbanized suburbs. It's a follow-up on my book, Boomburbs from 2007, but we're calling them metropolitan suburbs. And it's based on the ones that really changed the outcome of the election, actually. So yeah. we're in the book proposal stage. Most of the work will get done. We need the census to get counted, or I can't do anything. So hurry that census up, federal government. Yeah, right. Right. This has been fantastic. And this has been great. Thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed it. I love the audience questions. Len, I hope you guys will be back in session um, yeah. at some point in the near Soon, future. I hope. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we'd like to thank our audience. We're going to go ahead and sign off. I, I didn't, wasn't able to get all the questions I saw coming in, but we did get to a number of them. Thanks again to our audience and Rob again, and Camille, thank you. And I want to thank Sonny yeah. and Michael and Mary and Gerard. We got a whole team around us that help us to put on this webinar today. And I want to thank them as well. All right, great. take care guys, stay safe. Have a great afternoon, Bye. everybody. Thanks, you too. Take care, bye-bye.